Hello, I'm Ozzy, and unfortunately, I don't have a big idea to share with you today. Instead, I brought you a tiny little poem. It's by my favorite Turkish poet, a man who lost a letter of his name in a bet. It's titled Short, and it goes, Life is short, birds are flying. Let me give you an example. I met the love of my life 24 years ago on this very campus. She was a beautiful, smart, strong, kind, enthusiastic philosophy major, and I had hair. Within minutes, we connected. Within an hour, we were friends. Within weeks, we started dating. And within a few years, we got married under a giant shuttlecock. <laughs> I had something that I could not have even dreamed of. It's not like we both had been looking to get married we just could never separate. We just came together every day. We grew together. We helped raise each other. We were lucky to have loving parents and great friends, but mostly we had each other. And for many years, we fought along the way to get to where I should have been ecstatic. This moment in 2011, I had a soulmate, somebody who stood by me regardless of what happened. We'd had challenges, we'd had crazy stories. We suffered not just one, but two 7.4 earthquakes. We, we managed to escape from a hotel taken over by 15 armed rebels. Anne was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. I had many bubbles and many bursts throughout my career. I was a columnist, and then I was a retired writer. I was a movie producer, TV producer, with a bright future, and then I had nothing. Up and down. But all along the way, we had each other. And at this moment, I should have been full of joy and gratitude that we had come from that moment in 92, when I met her as a freshman here, to this moment, 19 years later, Anne was able to do what she loved doing, which was connecting people with each other and art and ideas, and she worked as an art educator. And her work was recently recognized. There was a symposium last week at Smith College in her honor where 300 of her colleagues attended. And I was able to be a part of that. And whatever I did, she was a part of it. But still, I wanted what we're all told to want in life, to live longer, to live with financial security, to live with reputation. I was the perfectionist. It just was never quite good enough and I would be caught with anxiety. And then Anne would hold me, and she would remind me the title of the autobiography of none other than Dennis Rodman. <laughs> she would have me say it. 
I'm as bad as I want to be. And it just was never quite loud enough or strong enough. She'd have me shaking and flexing and yelling. And then we'd both break out in laughter because it was just plain stupid. <laughs> but that little moment was always a reminder that no matter what happened, we had that. So I thought I would have been ready for anything. But shortly after that vacation that you, show, that you saw the picture of, we came back and got the news that Anne had late stage ovarian cancer, something where the median age is 62, and Anne was 38 years old. It was really one in a million. We couldn't find a rhyme or reason. Nobody was able to give us an explanation. It just fucking happened. All the worries, all the anxiety, nothing mattered. Because here was the real deal. I had spent my life having nightmares about this and that. And this was something that I would have been too afraid to have a nightmare about. And yet, this was my life. I woke up to it every morning, but my strength was in Anne. She went through a major surgery. Seven liters of cancerous fluid, ascites, was removed, and it came roaring back, so she had to go on chemo right away. And before we got a chance to get out of the hospital, I had to grab the kids, bring them, and and wanted them to cut her hair. And she showed her game face. And she crushed it. She did whatever she could have done with all the effort, all the fight, all the smile. And she went into remission, but the surgery wound would not close for eight months. So even when she was in remission, she still had a hole in her belly where you could see inside her every day when she was being treated. A after that closed, maybe there were two months where we were able to settle down and think, you know what? Maybe this is one and done. That would have given us some semblance of a normal future. We could learn from it, move, live even better, live more. I lost 60 pounds and quit smoking in the same year. I just could have jumped from a third floor of a building and kept running. It was fight or flight mode. We both were going to do whatever it took. But it wasn't quite enough. It came back quickly, telling us that we had maybe two years. Our hospital was in Boston which is anywhere from one and a half hours to four hours from where we live. We did that trip hundreds of times. She would get in all day long, treatment after treatment, doctor's visits. I mean, we're talking twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 worth of hospitaling in one day. And we would drive back that way, our kids would be home and comfortable. And this is Anne after one of those trips. It's around 9 p.m. 
were in a rest area and she's been through the ringer and she's smiling. She had made her peace with the anger, what had happened. She just was worried about what was next. She went to an ovarian cancer retreat two years after she was diagnosed. She said this was one of her favorite pictures because at this moment, she felt free. She said, I made my peace with living and dying. I'm not worried about what comes next. I know death will happen. I'm just going to live now. And we would have, when presented with a year left to live, realistically, we'd maybe make a bucket list. And didn't need to. She barely changed anything. She had been living the way she would have been living with one year left to live. She didn't want to travel to exotic places or get this or that. She got a lawyer. She wrote a will. She filed for home loan modification. Paperwork this thick four times. Nothing sexy, just love. And she just wanted to stay connected with the people she loved, because that's what she did. And that year, shortly after the retreat, she started having an intestinal blockage. So she was able to eat less and less and less. And finally, she could not eat any solid foods, and we were lucky if we could get 200 calories in her. But for months, she basically starved. And even here, a few days before she passed away, she was home with our children, Zayton and Ronan, connecting with them. She didn't stay there. She had quilts made from her clothes for each of our kids. She put quotes from her favorite book, The Little Prince. She recorded YouTube videos for all three of us. What uh, Magic Mommy sees in Ronan, Magic Mommy sees in Zayton, Pump Up for Ozzy, Lullaby for Ozzy. And our kids had always been constipated, so she had made up a song called A Poop is a Wish Your Butt Makes. <laughs> she recorded that too. She wrote a love song for me. My best friend recorded it. We listened to it on her deathbed. She finally thought maybe we can reach out and say something and maybe grab somebody else from ovarian cancer. So we reached out to one of my former colleagues in Turkey and told her our story. Wanted to raise awareness for ovarian cancer. But with the cultural differences and the fact that here was Anne saying, I have a few weeks left, but life is still beautiful, they decided this was a big story. And this interview went viral. 
many people were talking about Anne because she had shown what appeared to be courage. And she was saying, I've lived beautifully. I'm dying beautifully. I've been lucky my whole life. I met the love of my life. I had two great kids. I do what I love doing. I never said, why me then? Why should I say it now? She showed incredible grace. And when she died, she was in the news in Turkey that Annie passed away. There were tributes to her in social media, like this one by a Turkish designer. When Anne passed away, I didn't just lose my past. The woman that I had grown up with, that I shared my entire adult life, I lost more than a half of me. It felt like a tree being cut down the middle. Yet I still had to provide shade and shelter and thrive for my kids. I didn't want to live, but I had to survive. And then at Anne's funeral, my daughter picked up the mic and said, there's this quote from Wally. I don't want to survive, I want to live. She said, when you see me running around in the playground laughing, singing, acting like nothing happened, don't think I don't miss my mom. I'm just going to live like I promised her I would live. And Anne had been encouraging me as she was dying and starving to find love after her. We'd been each other's for 22 years, and yet she was saying, don't wait for years. I know you'll suffer, but don't wait. Two months, don't care what anybody says. Even if it's scandalous, don't care. Find love. Find someone who makes you happy. And a year after Anne died, I put her on my arm, and I put that little poem on the back of my hand so I would never forget it. Because life is short and birds are flying. 